Today on a couple of pointers podcast, we're lucky enough to have Kat, founder of Empirical Marketing App, Branding Agency. Yes. <laughs> Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me, Ricky. It's great to be here. We've had some incredible conversations and I'm so excited to introduce you to my audience and for them to get to learn from some of your insights. Incredibly unique perspective on marketing, particularly when it comes to peers, when it comes to, I guess, all of the little companies that the world's forgotten about unless you're a VC funded tech startup. But, you know, it's a great way that you put it in. Funnily enough, I started my career in the tech startup world. So that's a great compliment to hear that, you know, six years on to running this agency, we still retain a lot of that. And, you know, we've had great conversations. And I think the reason why we gel so well is we view marketing and sales as a collective function, which I know that we're going to talk about today. Would it be worthwhile just to talk about very quickly what we do with the agency? I would absolutely love it. Why don't you give us an introduction? Thank you, Ricky. So there are three key things that we do at the empirical agency for our clients. One is we help them stand out in a crowded market. Two is we help them generate more leads. And the third one is we help them close those leads and figure out how to get more value out of those customers. So a great way to look at this is how do you get referrals? How do you increase the customer lifetime value? How do you sell the next thing that to this existing customer base? And the clients that we choose to work with quite often are service-based businesses, professional services. Think of your accounting or any service where there are so many of them. How do you stand out in a market when everyone is fundamentally providing the same service? That's what we specialize yeah. in. Wow. Everyone I speak to, you know, we're an accounting <laughs> practice. We're web developers, yes. managed IT services. I'm like, how do you differentiate yourself? You're all the same. Yeah. And just to shed light on that, I think a lot of people, you know, use things such as their tenure. I've been in this industry for 20 years or I've received this award, which are all really great in terms of building that credibility. When I step into a business like this, it normally starts with a conversation as to why did you start this business? And more often than not, it's the founder or the CEO who started it for a reason. They were a subject matter expert. They spent a lot of time in the industry and they realized that there was a better way to do something. We really delve into that and we go, aha, like maybe somewhere along the way, as you grew, you lost touch with. And fundamentally, the reason why your business exists is because of that. How do we bring that into the picture and build that valid proposition for you to actually go, hey, look at me, this is why I do exist and I am for this particular niche or whatever segment you are. That's brilliant. Mm -hmm. It really is brilliant. So you're saying we don't have to just differentiate on price? Definitely not. Price is an easy one. Where I like to focus our time on is those people who are the premium players. There's a reason why you have a higher price point. The reason why you aren't converting isn't because you're more expensive. There are lots of different things there. It might be the wrong target market. It might be just the value perception. And again, it comes back to what is a customer value proposition? One, do you have the right customers? Two, are you articulating the right value? And does that come across to that customer? Yeah, amazing. Now, one of the things you mentioned, I had a conversation this morning, getting more referrals. How would you go about helping a company put a program together to get more referrals? You know what's really interesting? In this day and age, there's a software for literally everything. And we are so obsessed with automating, using programs, doing blasts, doing the things where we think we're going to get mass scale out of it. And the way that I look at most things is as a human, how do you do it? And as a business owner, I've asked for referrals. You also get referrals. The fundamental of a referral is you deliver a great sense of the other person, the receiver's end is happy. And it's just a matter of asking that question. The reason why a lot of people aren't comfortable in asking that question might be one, they don't feel as if they've delivered the service in the way that they should. Well, they think it's a sale or they think it's a nuisance. But if it's a case of saying, hi, John, you know, we're doing our monthly check-in, quarterly check-in as your account manager. Look, you know, it'd be great if you have anyone in mind. We're always looking to grow. If you have anyone in mind that fits this profile, it'd be great for you to connect me with them. And just to see that idea, it's, you know, the basic principle of asking for a favor. I like that. What's that book, Influence? So um, yeah. what this brings up is our main topic that I wanted to discuss with you, the sales and marketing alignment. You discussed the account manager asking for a referral, but that is mm. a sales function. Yeah. What do you see as this, the impact that can be gained by companies if they're really able to 
bring sales and marketing closer together? It's a really great question. And I think what I'll start with is I view marketing and sales as a revenue function. It's one collective function. And if we look at a very traditional setup, we have a marketing person, a marketing team, a salesperson or sales team. The shared objective is to make more money for the business, right? And marketing's role is how do they help find the right people and put that warm enough or interested enough lead in front of the sales for the salesperson to convert. So it's passing the baton as opposed to do two separate things. So the most obvious impact for marketing sales collaborations is obviously more revenue. To talk through how it leads to more revenue is if marketing and sales were to work together, you're going to learn faster as a team. You know, marketing yeah. is art. It's a largely a lot of science and it's based on your ability to test quickly, learn quickly and then apply it. So what happens is if marketing is on its own in silo, running these campaigns, some leads come through, they go off to sales, sales have these phone calls, but they're not, there's no feedback loop. There's no shared learning. What happens is mm, that's not an actual great test. So if you learn faster as a team, you're going to get to what you call your blueprint faster. If we send out 100 emails, three converts to lead, one converts to a customer, what do you do? Does marketing then send out 200 email blasts or should marketing focus on helping sales build collateral to change the conversion from three to one to three to two? It really is interesting. I saw a post yesterday around should marketing have a revenue target? It's a very simplistic way to ask a complicated question. But fundamentally, I love your view of it's just one revenue department. That's all we're trying to do here. And when you separate the two, you have Mm. marketing being measured on website visitors, as if you could push those into the bank. And marketing created or marketing qualified leads, Mm. people coming to an event, branding, which is a very badly understood term. I don't think I fully understand it. And then you've got sales being held accountable to numbers and pointing their finger at marketing, saying they're just sending us crap. That's a great way to put it. And I think you really hit the nail on the head. Of, I think, should marketing have a revenue target? It's an interesting one. I think if I take a step back, sometimes businesses put KPIs in place without fully interrogating why. It's a checkbox item. They go, yes, have a KPI right. in place. The question, if I wear my CMO hat for a business that we're working with, the question is to dissect that. But numbers mean nothing. Our target is $100,000 for the next month. What are the other metrics that we need to drive in order to get to that $100,000? And you use the example of website visits. Sometimes website visits do play a role. Sometimes it doesn't. And it comes back to what are all the KPIs that we need to look at and how do they influence that $100,000 number? Now, it's a sophisticated, complicated problem here. Do we get more website visitors? Do we convert more of those on our website to turn yeah. into leads? Are those leads even the right leads that are converting to revenue? These are not simple things. And one of the challenges maybe a lot of these companies might have is they hire someone to do a job. Yes. We're getting a junior marketing manager to mm-hmm. help us build the websites or for search engine optimization, basically get more people to our website. That is one tiny piece of a very big puzzle. Yes. What are some of the things companies can do to bring sales and marketing closer together? I think the first thing that a business should do, no matter how big your team is, is just look at the strategy. I think for, take your sales strategy for Q4, you know, we're leading up to that time. Your sales strategy, your marketing strategy, and go through it. You're going to realize a couple of things. One, you don't have a strategy. And what that means is you need to develop a strategy and develop the strategy as a, If you are a CEO, if you are managing director or in a management position, what's the revenue strategy and how does sales and marketing work together to deliver that? Now, let's say that you do have a sales strategy and you do have a marketing strategy. In this scenario, you might see this. So you don't have a complete overlap. And in a scenario where you don't see a complete overlap, where you don't see a symbiosis, the question is why? And quite often it's, what is the objective that we're working towards and what initiatives should marketing focus on to move the needle? And how does sales need to feed back to marketing in order to help them move the needle faster or move the right needle? So I would say before anything else, don't zoom into the we need a better system, we need to you know throw money at paid ads or we need to email another thousand people. 
take a step back, look at the strategy, because quite often when there are incongruencies, it's not because people aren't doing the right thing, it's because they had the wrong direction to begin with. Yeah, it's so accurate. It just resonates with me so much. We'll often say to clients when building an outbound motion, like you really need the right strategy. You mm. need somebody to execute on that strategy and then you need management to interpret the execution because it's not going to work straight away. And oh. that middle layer now needs to, you know, firstly, make sure it's being executed correctly and help interpret that so that we may have to readjust our strategy. So you need management, you need execution, and you need strategy. And that really shouldn't be any different here, right? I obviously have a very biased view of the world. I think every business, and I'll say service-based businesses, is a sales and marketing business. It's the key thing that's going to keep customers coming through. The rest of it is delivery, which is obviously in the operations, and there's lots of great things yeah. to that. So management should be thinking of their business as, if I had to wear a sales and marketing hat, what does my strategy need to be? So spot on. I tell all of my customers, this is why I love talking to you. It's like somebody who finally just agrees with me. I tell all of my customers, you're running two businesses. You've got your yeah. execution business, the business you set up, your managed IT, your law firm, your IT practice, yeah. whatever it is, that's your, your execution business. And then you've got a separate business, which is the one designed to sell your first. And they're actually quite unrelated. The example I'll use would be like the honey farm. You need to know how to make honey, how to nurture bees, how to you know, have the right environment for beekeeping. That's a complicated execution business. Then another part of your business probably also needs to understand about placement within large retail stores and negotiating those contracts and everything else when it comes to selling honey, building the website, like so completely different. Mm. Most MSPs, a lot of them I find are just so weak at that second business because that's not their core strength. And quite often that is the reality. I also think at some point, if we look at a business, when you start, it starts with potentially one person who is great at what they do, who also probably has the great skill communicating they do, so sales, right? But over time, as it goes, there can becomes complexities in delivering and delivering consistently. So there can come to a point where you're being a lot of executing, delivering, which is great. And what you do is you go, I'm going to put all my eggs in that basket and focus on that. When really like you want to do that, but you also want to keep your sales and marketing engine going. Because when you enter a recession or when you have, we've lost a customer for whatever reason, the stressful yeah. thing is going, what do I do? I need to top it up. But by the time that happens, the stress level increases as you kind of already too late because it might take three months to close a lead or it might take whatever it may be. So sales and marketing so many is get a, stuck there. Exactly. It's yeah. <laughs> exactly. They get stuck there because as soon as you start having to execute, you know, on how do I execute and do the sales and marketing? So yeah. now they start hiring people. Right? Now they, mm. start, they bring in someone to run sales, they bring in someone to run marketing, they've got a growing yeah. business. Mm. What are some of these, these metrics that will help align sales and marketing? Like what are some of the, the common metrics or the, the common language that should be shared? I'm going to start with sales metrics here because I think a lot of people understand sales metrics. I'm going to work my way backwards. So ultimately we know revenue is our the metric that we want to measure. How do you get to your revenue? Until we can deposit likes into a bank account. Oh, I'd love that. Yeah. So have your revenue. And if you work, if we look at sales and I think Ricky, you know, you can speak to this a lot more better than I can. You have your pipeline. And quite often, if we're talking about outbound efforts, we're talking about number of dials, the number of dials, the number of conversations you have. So how many people that you've dialed actually pick up the phone and you have a conversation with. From the conversations that you have over the phone, how many do, does that lead to an appointment or first time appointment or discovery call and so forth. So we're looking at the sales stages, right? What are the stages and what are the metrics to those stages? Because if I were to break it down, if you go dials to conversions, and you have that as a ratio and say that you have a really bad ratio, why? Is it because you're dialing the wrong numbers to begin with? You're dialing based on a really old database. You're dialing the wrong people. And then that's a database question. So is that something that marketing and sales can work together on to say, hey, how do we improve our data conversion ratios? One part of it yeah. is in the database. Obviously, the other part of it is in the salesperson's effectiveness which marketing doesn't have a big role in, but it's... Well, I, I don't know if it's a... It's probably not a secret that I believe that an outbound should fall under marketing more often than sales. <laughs> when you look at what could go right or could go wrong with an outbound campaign, so you've just mentioned the wrong list. I look at that as targeting. Mm -hmm. Are you targeting the right people? That's your list. Then it's around channel. 
what's the right channel yeah. to be communicating with these yeah. people? Maybe it's LinkedIn, maybe it's the phone, maybe it's email. Email's always been under marketing, like email marketing, you know, like oh. it's literally telemarketing, like there's marketing in the words, you know, LinkedIn marketing, that's- it's right there, like the answer in the name. Then it could be the messaging that's wrong. Maybe what you're saying isn't compelling, it's not interesting. Well, who's responsible for the messaging? Mm. Mark, like, literally, if there's anything going wrong in Outbound, the only department that can fix it realistically is marketing. The sales leader might be better at managing that personality profile, coaching on phones, things like that. And so often I think it does fall out of sales. And maybe that individual wants to become an account executive. So again, for career progression, that's interesting. You know, put them in sales. Yeah. No, it's a marketing function. It and I'm glad that you think so as well. I do it that way as well. And, you know, to put it simply, it's a lot of the times when we look at outbound, the question is what's working, what's not, right? And you've listed out so perfectly the list or the data that we have. Is it working? If it is, great. Why? Is it the roles that we're targeting? The hooks, what hook are we using? Uh, what hook isn't working? And having that documented as well. And this is qualitative data that marketing needs to own. And the more we figure out this works, that doesn't work, the more we get to what's right. And to answer or to round out the answer in terms of what other data points, I think start with sales. If we're talking about marketing and sales relationship, then the question is what other, you mentioned, what are the other channels that marketing can use to generate leads to equip their sales team with? In these scenarios, you have things such as you mentioned SEO, that's one possibility. You have LinkedIn ads, you have LinkedIn outbound, you have Google ads, meta ads and whatnot. With each of those respective channels, there's a way to identify same thing. Is your message working? Are you targeting the right? I like to focus, if you have an outbound team, what are the key metrics that you need to measure and what are the key metrics that you can look to improve by simply optimizing one or two things? And then once you have that in place, you can have the supplementary marketing initiative and that itself will have its own metrics. So for example, with Google ads, it's a case of, how many leads are you generating? Uh, what's the quality of these leads and what's the cost per lead? And fundamentally, no matter what you do, you should always be able to measure what's the cost per lead. So I would look at oh, that as an additional point. I've gotten into trouble recently by suggesting that everyone's salaries up to the CMO should be included in the cost per lead. It wasn't a very <laughs> popular opinion. It's Yeah, that's an interesting one. They'll definitely skew it. <laughs> I think the basic maths should be whatever your generating as a revenue obviously this is now what we're talking about bottom line right you still want to be a profitable business so if you do have marketers in the same accountability that you would have or similar accountabilities I should say for your sales people your marketing people should perform a function that supports revenue generation now marketing in itself has lots of different pockets So it's really hard to measure how much revenue does a graph designer bring in. But you should go, if I do all these different initiatives in Q4, but I don't see a change in my bottom line, then something's not right. Yeah, fair enough. And so now working back, so we've gone this metric of revenue and we're looking through, so dials, students, conversations, students, meetings, to opportunities, and opportunities Mm. to revenue. So we've we've got this funnel for outbound and more complicated sales processes as well within those final stages within an opportunity. What's that cutoff point where it goes from marketing to sales? What's that handover point typically like? I think it depends on what you mean by cutoff. I think if we're talking about at what point does the salesperson's key person communicating to the lead directly or indirectly, like by email, I mean, directly by phone calls and presentations, It's at the point where they need to be qualified. And I like to keep it simple. I often feel as if when there needs to be a phone call in place or when there needs to be something where a salesperson needs to take this person through that journey, the discovery process, I would cut it off there. So coming back to our metrics, the dials. So the dials is performed by a salesperson. And the reason why I don't feel as if it's a cutoff point is because Me personally, I like to know how one lead out of 100 moved to a dial through to conversations, to appointments and so forth, because that in in itself can inform what we're doing right Mm -hmm. to then. Does that make sense? Does that answer the question? It absolutely does. It makes so much sense. Things become crystal clear when you say it. (laughs) How else can marketing support sales, even within the sales function, within their opportunity? Uh, Within, sorry, what was the last part? Whether it's creating collateral, um, sales enablement, Mm -hmm. how involved should marketing be in that and where do you find that can sit within marketing's priorities? That's a great question. I would say, and 
maybe I'll use us as an example. When we enter a new business and we're looking at, we often get asked, you know, Kat, we need more leads or Kat can come up with a strategy. And what we do is we go, great, let's go back to the basics. And we go, we take stock of what they're currently doing. But what we do is we map it out. We go, great, you have dialogues, conversations, meetings, so forth. What do you have here? And quite often, if we look at the marketing funnel, we have awareness, we have interest, we have consideration, evaluation, and intent and purchase, right? So if you map that out, what I like to do is go, okay, when you're moving a lead through the funnel to become a prospect and then through to a customer, what are the key conversations or content pieces that is a must-have and is a nice-to-have? And so to give you some examples, a must-have could be a when you're presenting back to a prospect your solution, that's a must-to-have because you want that to be consistent. You want to consistently communicate your value proposition And if you have multiple BDMs or sales representatives, you want to have them all articulating the same value. That's a must-have. A nice-to-have might be a case study, as an example, if a customer or, sorry, if a prospect asks for a case study. So to answer the question as to how can marketing enable or support sales, the first one is understanding what's that lead journey and how do we give them the best experience possible, the information that they need at the right time so that they get confidence in choosing your solution at the end. When it comes to prioritizing what should marketing do first or what should marketing should focus on, I bring it back to the ratios. If we look at dials to conversations, conversations to appointments, appointments to meetings and so forth, you look at those ratios and you go, okay, our dial to conversations is 10%. If we got that to 20%, how many customers, if you do the max, at the end of it, how many customers would we have? By looking at ratio in your pipeline, and if you were to increase one and you look at the maps, you'll quickly realize where you should focus your efforts to move the needle. So what I find is when you have great salespeople who have the ability to sell very well, to sell with curiosity and to sell the value and the onboard, that's great. Marketing's focus isn't about giving the finding that presentation template or the quote template, that time there, while it'll be good to do, it's not going to give you a large return on effort. So why not focus on the earlier pieces in terms of how do you get your inside salespeople to, I guess, increase their dials to conversations ratio? And that comes back to, do we have the right database? Are we testing the right hooks? That's uh, set. Again, every time I listen to you, I'm like, how could any owner-run company without a marketing team figure this out? Because they may be great at delivery and execution. They may even be good at selling their product. But at Mm. some point, you're not going to be able to understand all of these complexities. Now, how would you go about measuring this on a continuous basis? You're talking about all of these ratios. Like We're not going to have an audit once a year to figure this out, right? There's got to be some kind of easy way to measure and track this at a continuous level. Absolutely. Um, If we're looking at how to continuously measure and improve, keep it simple, right? I do a couple of things. One is you have a start of month strategy meeting. That's where you have your sales and your marketing people in the same room. And you go over what I call the scorecard. So what belongs in the scorecard? Earlier we spoke about, we know that revenue is a key number that we're looking at. What are the other yeah. key we should look at? And let's talk as a team. Hey, last month or month before we sent out X hundred emails, this month we did that plus 20%. Are we seeing a difference? So by having a scorecard with your top 10 metrics, as an example, you'll start being able to tell the story as to how your efforts are playing out. And I think that's really simple. So when it comes to the scorecard, it's a simple task as to sit down in a room and go, what are all the metrics that we should be measuring and debate as to whether or not they belong there? Because the last thing you want to do is go through 50 metrics and for the sake of reporting, at the end of the day, there are a few key metrics that you need to track that will give you an indicator as to whether you move in the right direction. Just check in. So what's really, really interesting is quite often sales will sit in a particular area and marketing yeah. may sit in another area. It's as simple as when marketing designs a campaign, the salespeople should be informed. When marketing sends out the campaign, the salespeople should be updated. When marketing blasts the campaigns, marketing should check in with sales to go, have you seen anything? Have you noticed anything? Wouldn't you have some technology to do this? Oh, we do. And you know what? The best technology that we have is our feet and our mouth. (laughs) But obviously, I think sometimes like sales often have KPIs on their own where they have to make a certain number of dials a day. And we fear or 
we worry that we're distracting them. And I think the mindset shift and going, no, marketing is here to help sales. Have that conversation because once you start having the conversations, again, as I said earlier, quickly figuring out your blueprint is what you want to aim to do as a sales and marketing function. And you can't do that without talking. I love that you said that because I was leading you down the CRM route and you said, no, Ricky, don't go there. This is a human to human problem. This is people working together. What are some ways that sales could understand marketing a little bit better and marketing could understand the world of sales a little bit better? How could they go about achieving this to better collaborate or better understand each other's worlds? I personally think I'm a better marketer because I've worked in sales. Now, obviously, it's not always feasible to have sales and marketing walk each other's shoes in a day. But I think at the heart of it, I think it starts with management. Management to set their expectation and establish why does sales and marketing exist in that particular company. So it comes down to little things such as when you're hiring for a marketing person and it's on seek and it says about you, these are your responsibilities. In the responsibilities bullet point, is there anything about working in sales? So the first thing is as an organization, are you designing your sales and marketing to actually work together? But then beyond that, it's very simple practices such as you need to be aware as to whether or not you're putting a wall between marketing and sales. Remove that wall. Have the strategies I spoke about. You have a revenue generation strategy. What's sales parts? What's marketing's part? You have a start of month meeting. Let's talk about the strategy. How are we performing against it? Is there anything that's working really well that we need to double down on? Anything that we haven't seen results yet that we need to interrogate as a team? So you get that insights and a shared. I wouldn't say you have your own scorecard, but there's also a shared scorecard. And looking at that as well and understanding what's the story or what's the data telling us. Because the last thing that you want to do is you want to have a war between sales and marketing. Marketing measures themselves based on things that you may feel as if it's superfluous, such as website traffic. Sales go, I have a strong pipeline. This is based on all my efforts. If you have all those things in place that I've mentioned, the organizational design to put sales and marketing together, you have an understanding and shared strategy. You're having a start of month meeting. You're having a scorecard that everyone understands how they influence. Then it should work. You should have a cohesive sales and marketing team. Seems like you're starting to touch on culture there. I'm busy doing this enterprise chief revenue officer course. And the oh. instructor was asked the question, should marketing, should the CMO report to the chief revenue officer? And he gave the most powerful answer. He said, if the CRO is particularly strong at marketing, maybe, but mm. otherwise, no. And everyone was like, oh, wow, that makes so much sense. Why not? And they said, because the caliber of CMO you will get if they report directly to the CEO is probably higher than the caliber you might get of one that's willing to work underneath a CRO. And he's ultimately, we want a better person to do the job. I was like, wow, there was no ego. This was just about what's best for revenue. I get that culture is difficult, but when you can bring sales and marketing together as a team, it's quite powerful. What would be something listeners could do tomorrow? What something super actual you could do tomorrow to help bring your sales and marketing department functional team a little bit closer together? Oh, okay. What is it that they can do tomorrow? That is, oh, where do I start? Okay. Is this list a little bit too long? I, okay. What is it that they can do tomorrow? I'm going to start with this. I think as a business, if you are the owner of the business, if you are in a management position or you're worrying about your sales, you would know whether or not you have a sales and marketing problem. That's the first thing, right? Like you either go, we are, we have our sales and marketing function down pat because leads are flowing in. I'm seeing conversions. That's great. In that scenario, the question is innovation. What else could we be doing? And you get people to the room, you have something along those lines go, we're doing really well. Let's recognize that for whatever these reasons are, great processes, great systems, everyone's worked together really well. What else would we do? I think that's a conversation that you'd have if you have a performing sales and marketing function. Let's say that a lot of people, your awareness as a business owner is you go, I don't have a predictable lead flow. I don't know what the pipeline value is or I don't know what we're going to get next quarter. Have that awareness to go, okay, what's wrong? Like, why isn't this working? And my, I would say you need to look at your strategy. A lot of people, when they have a problem, solutions that may feel good, it may feel productive, but fundamentally you're not looking at the bigger problem. I'll go back to that exercise. So what's your strategy? Like what is sales doing? What's marketing doing? One, is it documented? No. There you go. That's the first one. Two, if it is documented, is there an overlap? So for me, I am very big on being on the same page with the strategy first before you look mm -hmm. at your needs or tactics. 
because quite often yeah. that's where the problem is. Yeah, we get very, very quickly get into the tactics. Absolutely. Take a balcony view of what's happening. Yeah, brilliant. Now, I'd love to learn a little bit more about your agency. I know you're here and you're generously educating my audience. The last two customers that came on board to your agency, what did they mm. look like? What was their main problem? But why did they come to you? I love this question. Of the last two customers that I've come on board share a very, very similar problem. And it starts with, you know, we talk about symptoms, right? Like what are the symptoms that show you're trying to fix that symptom? So the symptom has always been, hey, cat, we need more leads. They said the same thing to me. Oh, yeah, we need more leads. And yeah. the customers choose to work on, we look at their business. We go, okay, talk me through what's happening. But it comes back to they sound like everyone else and they're putting in the efforts. And I often, you know, use the analogy of throwing mud at a wall and hoping something will stick. So there's no strategy behind their marketing and how marketing should support sales. And what we do is we go, great, you are a law firm, you are an IT service provider, you are an accounting firm, you are an HR recruitment firm. It comes back to what makes you different to the next guy. And what I start hearing is what I said earlier. I said, yeah. we've been around it for seven years, 10 years. We have these awards. We have best in class, da, 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 da. It's a valid proposition issue. So the first thing I do is I go, let's work on your valid proposition. There's what we call, what I call moment of truth. When I work with the last two customers we've worked with, we jump in, we go, we're going to solve your lead problem. Don't worry. But the reason why there's a lead problem is actually because you have a valid proposition problem. I'm going to fix this first before I fix this. When we yeah. drill down and fix their valid proposition problem, it's transformative. And I know that obviously I'm going to, you know, put our agency on a high pedestal. But the reason why that's transformative is it gives them a sense of direction or a mind of why they exist in the first place. Number two is how they need to articulate that value. And they have, we document it, we circulate it, we get buy-in or we get feedback then buy-in. And everyone says, you have put into words what we fragmentally say in different conversations. And having that documented is so powerful because now that we have something that we are confident of because the company's been around for some time and they want customers based on that, we're just standardizing what's really worked well and we offer perspective too. So once we fix the valid proposition problem, then we go, okay, now how do we solve the lead problem? And that's what we do. And once we solve the lead problem and we find the blueprint on how to, you know, what should marketing do to support sales, solving that question, then we go, great. The last part is now that we have more customers, how do we get our customers to bring on other customers? So referrals, or we look at things such as, hey, you now want to offer X, Y, Z, a different product, different solution. We help them work with that. The best way I would describe us is you work as your marketing team. I call myself a principal CMO and the clients that we choose to work with, there aren't, we don't have a huge clientele base. We work with select few because these problems are hard to solve. We need to draw focus on it. I work as a CMO and you have a team that understands one, how branding works. And that's why we call ourselves a brand and marketing agent. We don't just pump things out there. We first understand your yeah. brand and we figure out how to market it. So we're your brand marketing team essentially. Yeah, that's so brilliant. The agencies that I speak to are yeah, often a little bit of a cookie cutter approach where like we do performance marketing. Yeah, you know, we could mm -hmm. at, we could put up Google Ads. Yeah. That's not solving a fundamental problem. You'll get more leads in, but you're not addressing your underlying issue. How are you gauging your market? How are you going to market? What is your message? Who are you? And I see it all the time because I don't I think Point has got problems here. We have a lot of the symptoms that you talk about and it really resonates where I right. struggle to articulate the value that we deliver and how we different. I mean, I can't even differentiate pointer like this high touch, hyper involved sales agency where we are essentially a fractional CRO, VP of sales, yeah. full strategic support. And I can't even differentiate ourselves from a call center. I just got a lead request today. Somebody trying to book a meeting with me saying we need more leads. And I go look at his website. I'm like, we won't work with this company. Like, this is not. Yeah. I think, but he thought we would work with them, but we are clearly just attracting the wrong people that don't understand that. So genuinely resonates a lot. Mm -hmm. And I think all of your clients are certainly lucky to have you and the broader community yeah. in general is lucky yeah. to be yeah. able to learn from you. So thank you for sharing some of this incredible wisdom and knowledge. It's inspired me to really try up my game on my marketing, but more so than my marketing in trying to find that all of company 
revenue process where we're actually tracking website visitors and we're actually tracking the metrics and seeing how it converts all the way through to say, based on this, can I pinpoint where the problem is and how can I address it? And whilst I'm motivated to do it, I know I don't have the fucking capability or the skill set to do it. So mostly that motivation is to bring a professional on board like you to help. Oh, I think, you know, one of the things I love to do is have conversations with people. Not everything needs to lead to a deal. And sometimes it's about the right time. So if you have any questions or if anyone has any questions in terms of, you know, he said this cap, what's the next step from here to have conversations and to help people think about how to do things differently and then give them a heads up as to which direction they should take or how do they implement the next thing. So always happy to help. And it's been great to come on and speak to you. And, you know, I think our first phone call that we had several you know, weeks or months back, it was kind of like a mirror image. Like how I view marketing and how you view sales is really two sides of the same coin, <laughs> which is great. It really is great. It really, because our, my organization clearly lacks the other side of the coin. We're a sales agency. So now somebody's listened to this, they thought Kat is exactly the kind of person or agency I need to support my business. And where can they go f- to find out more about Empirical and where can they get hold of you? Well, this is going to be on LinkedIn. So I would say I'm going to make it easy for you. Find me on LinkedIn or I will be tagged and send a connection request and we'll trade mobiles and we'll jump on a call. As I said, God gave us great technologies, our feet and our mouth, and that's what I'm going to go with. <laughs> <laughs> and a cell phone oh, amazing all right well genuinely thank you so much for coming on i'm so excited to share this with my audience with them to get to learn and just a tiny bit of what you know thank you it's been such a pleasure thank you so much for having me ricky